Um, in the last two lectures, uh, we have seen uh, examples and some theory of brittle localized deformation. We have seen faults, we have seen fractures, and now we are going to go a little bit deeper in the earth and look at ductile deformation. Deformation which is time dependent, temperature dependent, we have seen uh, the theory of that. And the structures which form under these conditions are, if you want, a little bit less discontinuous. They are folds or shear zones. So this lecture is about folds and shear zones. Here is a very nice example from the Alps. It is a piece of marble. It's different layers in it. And you can clearly see that these layers have been folded. And if I turn the rock around and you can see around the corner and study them in three dimensions. So what I will do is I will uh, show you some examples of faults. Okay, so in this lecture I'm going to tell you uh, about the geometry of faults. I will show you that just like in the faults, there are very small faults and there are very big ones and that these systems are in some ways like self-similar. Then I will show you some examples of how to analyze the geometry of folds. And then we will try to understand a little bit about the mechanics of folds. Why do certain kinds of folds form uncertain, under certain kinds of conditions? After we have finished the folds, I'm going to tell you a little bit about shear zones, which are the ductile equivalent of folds in the earth, shear zones. And that will be the end of the structural geology part of this lecture course. In the next lecture, we will start with the tectonics lectures and look at much, much larger scale. Okay. So, I think this is a very good place to start. Uh, you probably all have seen this faults in the Ortetal excursion um, in one of the summers. Um, you have... Uh, been standing here and climbed around the fold. Uh, it is a limestone outcrop which was folded by horizontal shortening during the Variscan orogeny and the limestone layers have been bent into this anticline and the process which was very important here was flexural slip maybe you remember. So this is a fold which is maybe 10 meters in size. Here is an example from Oman, which is much larger. You can see limestone layers. This is also an anticline going around, and on the other side, they go down. This is an anticline which is many hundreds of meters in size. And in fact, you can see it very well in Google Earth. And on the course website, we will give you the uh, pointer to actually look around and you can fly around the fold and study it. Here is a fold from the Alps. You have to hike for many hours to have this view. And here you see even bigger folds. These are all 3,000 uh, meter high, uh, high mountains. And this is limestone from Jurassic age in flat lying folds very beautifully structured. Now, folds, just like many other structures, are not just restricted to rocks. Here is an example of folds that you have all seen before. These are the folds in a thin layer of oil on water. If you go to a gas station and you're not careful and you spill a little bit of the petrol, you can see these folded structures. And this one here is maybe half a meter in size. But folds can even be much smaller. Here is a fold in a microscope. This is a thin section. This is just one millimeter in scale. And you can see that the layer is folded. Small ones, big ones, and very big ones. They all look to some extent similar, except the very, very large folds because these structures are so big 
that gravity comes into the game. And what you see here also is that the layer which is folded is accompanied by a new horizontal layering. It is called the cleavage, schieferung in German. And I will get back to this at the end of the fold lecture. So, in summary, there are in the earth crust very large folds and very small folds. And one way to describe these ranges in size is using Fourier series. You have uh, had your mathematics lectures and you learned about Fourier series, which is nothing else than a lot of superposed cosine functions on top of each other. And here is one example where you can see that this is the big fold and then that this is the second order fold and these are the third order folds. You can take a folded layer and you can even analyze it using Fourier techniques and get the coefficients of the Fourier series which then gives you this structure. So small folds, big folds and they all look more or less similar. Now, how do folds look in three dimensions? Well, here is an experiment. Experiments are very nice because you can draw straight lines on top of the experiment before the folding, so you know exactly what has happened. Here, after we've cut it, you can see the folded layers, but when you go and follow them in the third dimensions, you see that there are a lot of complexities. The folds don't just continue forever. Sometimes they stop, just like a fold, which has a tip. Okay? And here, at this point, there are two very important characteristics of folds that you have to remember. But let me write down first, today we are talking about folds and not folds. It sounds similar, but it is very different. Okay, so let me draw a fold for you. Here is a layer, and it is folded into this structure. I maybe put a little bit of three-dimensionality into it. And this fold has a symmetry plane, okay? This, this one here. And this plane is called the axial plane, Achsenfläche in German. And there is one additional very important element that is this line here and it is called the fold axis in German Faltenachse fold axis so very, very simply, in a stereogram, if you would measure the elements of this fold, this is the Schmidt net, in the lower hemisphere, this is north, this is south, west, east, then a fold may look like this. These would be measurements of planes. And they all lie on a great circle. And if you take the pole of this great circle, this would be the fold axis. Okay, very simple, but you must understand this, otherwise you cannot talk about faults. And now, 
I can say that the axial planes of these folds and also the fold axes are in fact curved. They are not completely straight. Here is a similar example from nature. This is an outcrop of a, a layer looked on top. And this is about one meter. And there are thin layers in the, this rock and you can see the folds. They are wrinkles and they actually end or maybe they split into two other folds. Very similar to what I've shown you in the experiment. And in the textbook it is explained like this. These are the folds, axial planes and these are the fold axis. And here this particular fold axis basically stops and the deformation is taken over by another one. When you make profiles of the Ardennes or the Eiffel Mountains, you will always get structures like this. So when you see a fold in the outcrop, you shouldn't think that this fold axis continues forever. At one point it is gone. Okay, another piece of nomenclature. You have all heard the names syncline and anticline. Syncline is the U-shaped fold and anticline is the A-shaped fold. But there is one more part of the definition. A syncline is in fact a fold in which the younger rocks are in the center. Okay? So this is old, this is young old and young and this is a syncline but this is also a syncline which has been turned upside down okay so the definition of a syncline is a fold which the which has the younger rocks in the center and an anticline is like this the older rocks are in the center to say in which way this syncline is oriented, we have came up with the word synform and antiform. So this one is a synformal syncline. This one is an antiformal. Wait a minute. This is an antiformal syncline. This is an antiformal anticline, and this is a synformal anticline. Okay? It sounds very complicated, but in fact it's not. You have the synclines, which have the younger rocks in the center, and they can be turned upside down by later deformation. And you have the anticlines, where the younger rocks are on the top, and the older rocks are in the center, and these can also be turned upside down. Now we have to come up with ways to describe how folds are rounded. So, these folds where the layer boundary is really very gently curved and the curvature is rather continuous are called rounded folds. And then there are folds where the limbs, <coughs> okay, these are the fold limbs, are actually quite straight and then there is a curved hinge. I can write it down for you. So this here is a limb and this is the hinge. And then there are folds like this one here which are really quite sharply changing orientation and they are called chevron folds. 